Welcome to Key County Connects, a program where we connect you with the important issues in our region. I'm Enrique Cerna. King County has a new sheriff. Mitzi Johanknik is a 33-year veteran of the sheriff's office. She was sworn in this January after defeating former sheriff John Urquhart in 2017. She joins us today to talk about her new team and her new direction for the department. And Sheriff, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. How does it me. feel to be called King County Sheriff? Yeah, it's a little, a uh, little bit different, yeah. right? Um, I've come up through the ranks of the sheriff's office, but uh, it's an honor. It's humbling to be called sheriff. You go from, uh, I think you were in Burien right before this? Yes, I was the precinct commander there. And how many people were you the commander there? Of? Probably 60 some folks, yeah. And now you go to a thousand person force and you're the, the top cop in yeah. here in King County. Um, how, when you wake up in the morning and suddenly realize you're in charge of this, mm -hmm. what do you think? How do you feel? You know, I feel energized. I feel excited because there's so many gifted people in the King County Sheriff's Office and so many people that have the heart of service and want to be out there working with their community. And so it's inspiring to go work with them, work for them in many ways, and, and help promote the good works of the Sheriff's Office. Why did you want to be the Sheriff? It's kind of a complex uh, answer for that, but uh, Deep down in my heart, it was the right thing to do at the right time. Um, I, I thought that um, there were better things that we can do and directions we could take to um, focus on the good works that the employees do rather than the, the negative things that um, were coming out about members. And, and while those things happen and you have to fire people sometimes, um, there was nothing about, there was no direction about how best we could go about talking about the good works and, and expanding on public service aspect of it. There were some officers that felt that the department had developed a toxic uh, environment. Did you feel that? Yeah, I did. I, f I felt that. I felt that through the campaign. Uh, people who were working for me were targeted. Um, and so, you know, we, treat, we need to treat everybody with dignity and respect, and that means internally as well. And you can hold people accountable and be consistent in how you, you manage that personnel aspect of things. But if we want our deputies and our sergeants and others to treat people with dignity and respect, the tenor and tone has to start at the top of the organization. And that's what I've brought and that's what I intend to do. Was that the motivating factor because of the toxic workforce environment that was alleged by many of the, the other officers uh, during that time? I, it was a major driving factor, yes. Uh, people from inside and outside the department came to me and asked me to run for sheriff. It was not something I ever planned on doing um, in my career. It wasn't where I saw my career path going. But you step up at the right time and you make the hard decisions to do what you think is the right thing and, and for the majority of people and I think that this is the right thing. So let's talk about um, what are your priorities for this department. Um, you're the newbie in a way, you know, you, you've gone from being a commander to suddenly taking over this you know, huge force. Uh, I know you have uh, set about trying to come up with a blueprint that will guide you. Um, Pretty early, you've mm -hmm. only been uh, in in the office here for just a short amount of time. But True. Um, do you have an idea of what that blueprint is and, and what you want in it and how how it's going to guide you? Yeah. So we're speaking about um, getting in place a strategic plan so that we can plan for the future beyond me, beyond others in the organization now, and set up the leadership and and uh, momentum for the sheriff's office. One of the major branches for me that's going to be new is having a public outreach section. And in that section, we'll do a variety of things, including media relations and um, recruiting and other aspects, bring in advisory councils to help us with the strategic plan from our various communities. And, and then a second piece is getting um, the right equipment 
to, the, to our members so that uh, we do the least amount of harm possible when we have to go hands-on with people or, or use force or make those hard decisions. And that includes excellent training and de-escalation and other, other um, crisis intervention training and forming good teamwork as we uh, come upon, upon people in crisis. So let's talk about that uh, as far as break some of this down. Sure. Uh, the idea of having some media relations and relationships and building that and public engagement, I take it. Mm -hmm. um, what's, what's your idea behind that and, and how will that benefit the, the department? So I think um, we've moved into, we've been in for a very long time now, a 24-hour news cycle. Yeah. <laughs> and we've only had one media relations officer. Really? Yeah. So that media relations officer is continually handling everything day and night. And so, you know, we're trying to cover a long, many hours of it every day, but we miss things. And we tend then to be driven by um, what the media is asking us about rather than providing them with information and things that we're doing, the right things that we're doing, the consistent things that we're doing. And, and, uh, and so my chief of staff, who I'm in the process of hiring, will, will come with a, a pretty good media background to help us out in that regard and has a lot of experience in public community um, interaction. So, um, the, social media, I take it, is going to be very important. Social media, thank you, will be very important. And we, you know, we don't have a one person who even um, sees us through that. It's spread out amongst people when they have time after doing their other jobs. This is very surprising for, uh, you know, probably one of the biggest county police operations in in the state that you may only have one person doing media yeah. relations. <laughs> yeah. That's always that shocking. Yeah, and then when that person's gone, we have people filling in. So we need to find a way to, to more broadly have, you know, have folks that are, that are comfortable doing media relations and filling in the gaps for us. Um, so that's exciting. But, you know, we've had, um, uh, Sheriff Urquhart was the media relations person for many, many years. Um, I don't come from that school. I've done some media work before running for election, but you know we need some good, experienced folks in. And our current media relations officer, Cindy West, is retiring, so um, there'll be some change. So, do you also look at this as a way of um, beyond that the community engagement part of it, of getting yes. the sheriff's department connected with the community? Because there's, a, there's a, always an issue of trust with law enforcement Absolutely. these days. Absolutely, yeah. And before, um, the sheriff handled most of the community engagement. And what we need to do in my administration is have, from the ground up in our organization, people being involved in their communities that they serve and, and having the faith that they will be supported by their command team and and given some training and feel comfortable engaging back with the community. Because we have, um, you know, there's a change of uh, a lot of young officers coming into the organization. Um, and so getting them comfortable in, in that kind of engagement is important. And we have folks up in the organization and leadership positions that have very good background in that. And so helping push decision making down and working through that. That's just one aspect, but community advisory councils that I want to set up, uh, working on the strategic plan will engage the community a lot. You know, generally, um, I, I suppose that the, when there's a transition from one sheriff to another, just as in many other offices, there's that period where the, the person before you might is going to help you with the transition, but that hasn't been the case for you because uh, former Sheriff Urquhart has not communicated with you. He's not talking to you. Mm -hmm. How difficult has that been then? And who have you turned to to help you with becoming comfortable and understanding the enormity of the job? Well, I've been very, very thankful for the, all the members of the Sheriff's Office who have stepped up and helped us in this transition. And it's, and it's awkward because um, sheriff Urquhart was my sheriff up until yeah. the end of December. He actually promoted you. And he did, and I was working for him still. And so I had a precinct to run. I also had to work after hours on transition, in, you know, into the into the new role as sheriff. And so um, there were a lot of people 
um, Chief Deputy Jim Pugil helped a, a, a whole lot, and all of the section leads and commanders were just generous with their time. Mm -hmm. But still, that probably that gave you some um, uh, challenge then in that whole transition period. Did you turn to others on the outside, like you know, former King County uh, Sheriff uh, Surar or others like that? That's a great question, and there have been so many people that have helped. Uh, County Executive Constantine, uh, Council Members McDermott and others, um, and their, uh, Sue Rar, who's the director of the Washington State Criminal Justice Training Center, was very helpful. I had talked with former sheriff and now Congressman Dave Reichert, and so people have been very generous, Sh uh, former Sheriff Steve Strand as well, and, and many of the sheriffs across the state actually contacted me. So uh, there's been a lot of help. There's a lot of places I can go for resources and answers if I need them. And there's so many things that I didn't know. When you wake up in the morning, what's your first thought about and concern about your department and what might be happening out there? My first thought and concern is, is everybody in the department okay today, this morning? Um, as a matter of fact, this morning I got a call at three, three, about 3 a.m. Um, took the call and one of our deputies had been hurt. It was a minor thing, um, but um, you know, those are the things that you have concern about. Just yesterday, I was at the memorial service for the Pierce County right. deputy who uh, was killed in the line of duty. And so, you're, you know, you always have those concerns and hope those things don't happen on your watch. But in this work, um, there are risks that you take and uh, there's potential for injury. Yeah. So that's what I worry about. When you say that there were things you didn't know, one thing in particular you could point out? Let's see. That surprised you? Um, yeah. So what surprised me uh, were the, the number of personnel issues that were pending mm. that had to be taken care of and, and looked into. Um, there were good surprises as well. Um, and finding out in, in new areas that I didn't have information on before about, uh, again, the good works and the community support that came rolling in has been really helpful. And it's just, it makes your heart sing when uh, you get letters from California and other places uh, across the nation, people just wanting to support you because you were elected. Um, so, uh, those things have been surprising, and it's nice to know there's so much support for the sheriff's office. Let's, let's talk about some of the uh, areas that you, uh, I guess, could be priorities, but there will also be issues that you have to deal mm -hmm. with. Uh, body cameras. Mm -hmm. Do you want your officers to have body cameras? Yes, I do. And, but we have to remind people, too, that that's just one angle that you're seeing from a body camera, and there are many more. Um, you know, angles of how things happen and what, what may or may not be visible. Um, and procuring them uh, through government processes takes a period of time, as well as setting the policy for them and then training with them. Are there any body cameras being used by King County no. deputies right now? No. Wow. That's surprising to me. Yeah. But. I believe Sheriff, right, or Sheriff Urquhart was working on it, um, and that uh, didn't progress past uh, into this year. There's an initiative, a statewide initiative, 940, I'm sure you're well aware yeah. of, uh, that would require mental health training, de-escalation training, also removes the word malice from state law and defines what uh, is good faith to reform police prosecutions when there is wrongdoing mm -hmm. that occurs, particularly when it comes to police shootings and the use of deadly, deadly force. Where do you stand on that? Well, I've supported Initiative 940 uh, since I started my run for office, and um, it's, I think it's an important piece of work that needs to be done within the legislature. I talk about reimagining law enforcement during the campaign and, and now in office. We, we think about that every day because there is this gap, that this void that from across the country that you feel and you sense, and, and it's important and you talked about trust earlier. And that's, um, that's really important. Without trust, we can't really do our job well. And uh, in that reimagining thinks about things like an initiative 940 and common sense um, law that can come into place to help 
build trust from the community and make sure that there's um, fairness of, and access and transparency in what we do. Uh, safe consumption sites or uh, injection sites for people that may be heroin users, where do you stand on those? I'm against those. I, I don't believe that we've done enough uh, work around what's, what law enforcement role is around safe injection sites. More importantly, I'm worried about victims and re-victimization. And so as we think about this and people coming into a specific site and out of a site um, to use con um, um, consume um, drugs, that they can be re-victimized. And talking to women who have been uh, rescued out of human trafficking, that's, their concerns are that this is a prime place for, for people to be um, picked off the street and moved into human trafficking. Victimized. Yeah, victimized, yeah. exactly. So um, there's a lot to it. Um, the other aspect is what I've known from people who, who use heroin, that when they get their heroin, they want to find a place right now to use it. So I don't know how, um, how that draw in to travel to use um, drugs will work for them. So it's an issue, do you want to work with the council on this, or what do you do? Um, I've already started working with um, Public Defender's Office, who's interested in this, and Lisa Dugard. I look forward to working with council and the executive on this. Um, ultimately, though, it, you know, it's my job to enforce the laws and ordinances of King County and the state of Washington. What do you see as uh, the the effort or what your department needs to do um, to handle issues of when you use deadly force or you're in a situation where officers have to use their firearms so that it is done, you know, obviously the, these situations can happen so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, you may have been involved in them yourself, so you may know per firsthand all of this, but so that, the, that there is um, Again, it's that trust issue I think that people have about being, uh, having a uh, situation with an officer and feeling that, okay, they can feel safe, particularly mm -hmm. in communities of color. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm informed a lot by my daughter, who's uh, uh, a black woman living in New York City, married, and, and um, can really um, help me best understand. Uh, and so she's been really upfront with her mom <laughs> mm -hmm. about uh, being a cop and um, her views and around the issues with law enforcement. Um, we have great conversations. Sounds like she's given you the talk. She has given me the talk, much like earlier I gave her the talk about you're going to be driving now and and consider these things, right? So when you come from a position of having to tell a person of color who's very close to you that, um, that here's the things you need to look out for when you're pulled over by a cop, coming from a cop, it's a pretty tough conversation to have. Um, but, but she's uh, kept me informed throughout her life and helped me understand things more closely. And the importance of of how we work with community and communities of color. Um, that's part of that whole public outreach piece that needs to be done. We need to speak about the, the tools that we have. We need to increase the tools that are less lethal options for us. And we're doing that uh, this month and working hard on policy and getting the shotguns that have been ordered that fire um, sponge or beanbag rounds, common language. Um, those things help us uh, create distance between us and somebody in crisis who's, who's armed or a threat. So there's so many things we can do, so much training we can do um, to build the community's trust in us. When we don't use these tools, as they were um, suggested to us in 2012 by the Park Report, uh, that we should be doing these things, now we're doing those things. And Technology is changing all the time, provides us options. I want to go back to your daughter yeah. and having the talk. Um, because, in a sense, it's, it's a bit of a role reversal, but I, I suppose you had a talk with her about maybe using the car and all of these yeah. things. Also, a talk with her about, as a police officer, um, how do you handle yourself 
if you're stopped, I've had that talk with my son numerous mm -hmm. times, you know, I, it's listen and obey and, mm -hmm. you know, don't overreact, those types of things, um, worried about you. Yeah. So how did she then help you in understanding where she's coming from or what she would feel? Well, um, I come from a place of privilege as a white woman. And so um, helping to better understand her feelings and her emotions and how she's looked at and how she's treated. Um, you know, engaging in just those deep down conversations about um, her feelings and insights. It's hard to explain, Enrique, but that um, really gut-wrenching conversations that happen to truly understand, we need to dive into the culture and the background and the history of this country. And I, I think that's something that we need to do more of in law enforcement. I'm looking forward to working with Sue Rar at the uh, with the Criminal Justice Training Center because she's got some some ideas about um, how we can at at Basic Academy dive into helping people understand. Mm -hmm. um, we are predominantly a white male driven. Um, law enforcement career um, and so making that change and making sure we um, work with communities during the campaign I worked a lot with the Vietnamese community and in listening to the elders of the community and having them say we know the barriers that are keeping our young adults and others from uh, being interested in law enforcement and if you come and listen to us and understand those barriers your recruiter, recruiting team can do a much better job. Mm -hmm. And so that's just one community. Um, and so if we do that with all the communities, like I had the conversations with my daughter. Mm -hmm. um, you have we'll, to listen. What's that? You have to listen. You have to listen. Yeah. Yeah. Why did you want to become a cop? Uh, I had a big old heart of service. So um, I went to college to play basketball and I ended up getting an education. And through that time and playing a lot of team sports um, kind of made me realize that there's, you know, to make things go well, you need to, you need to be on a, on a bigger team and um, be a good member of a team. And uh, I had a, a softball coach who uh, was one of the first women to be in the field as a corrections, uh, a Department of Corrections person. And she said, you know, you really should look into law enforcement as a career. Look at the state patrol. And this is just as I'm coming out of college. Mm -hmm. um, and I had friends who were already working for the sheriff's office. And so went on a ride along and six months later, I was in the police academy. You actually started out as a teacher, didn't you? I was going into education. I was gonna do that, absolutely. Yeah, yeah changed my mind. Did the ride along, was that the, the key to changing your mind? The ride along really was because in in that moment, it wasn't what a, most of our ride-alongs go pretty smoothly, and there aren't they aren't exciting like TV, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the paperwork doesn't get done in one eight-hour span either. It's um, so the going on that ride-along and seeing um, my friend interact with community members and and be a real problem solver. It just kind of was that moment to say, yeah, I think I'm going to give this a try. And uh, 33 years later, here I am. Well, you know, it seems these days that um, law enforcement, um, in law enforcement, there, there's, there's a lot of pressure because uh, you're not only trying to enforce laws, but you, in, you're becoming a social worker sometimes. Mm -hmm. So is, are, are your deputies prepared for that? Do they need more training for that? Uh, where, where are you? Yeah. We deal a lot with folks that are in crisis for a variety of reasons. And that's changed a lot from when I started. Um, it, when I, when I was on patrol, it was the rarity where you'd run into it. Now, if you listen to a police radio at any precinct for just an eight-hour shift, you will hear multiple calls and responses during that time. And, and so over the course of 24 hours, that's a lot of our work. You're right. Um, but the, 
the laws that we follow only give police officers the ability to deal with some of these things. And so it's really important that we're good at it and we understand coming into the job that it's about serving everybody with dignity and respect, even folks that are in crisis, and, and being patient and doing what you need to do. Sometimes you have to react fast, but there's other times when you can take time to help somebody work through this. We're getting support from other areas too. We have mobile crisis teams. There's more that we need to do. There's more training, you're right, about helping um, deputies understand. But I think it's about looking at how we're hiring too and bringing um, and tra testing for those skills and, and making sure people know that those skills are required. This is a job that has politics in it. Uh, you have to run for office, it obviously. Does. Yeah, <laughs> but also the fact that uh, uh, you know, unlike if you're a Seattle police chief, you, you're you're dealing with other entities, other government entities, mm -hmm. uh, and that you have contracts with the cities and towns yes. and the Muckleshoot uh, tribe as well. Um, how are you handling that, or or how are you prepared for that? Do you think? I've had the opportunity to get out and, and meet some of our other elected officials. I'm looking forward to doing other visits. Um, we're only a few weeks in and my schedule is pretty full every day. Um, and, and I'm meeting um, with the executive more than once since I've been here. For me, it's about partnerships. It's really important that we work together um, not one entity in my mind is more important than the other. It's about delivering good public service to all of our communities. And so what's the best way we can go about those things? What, what things do we have to look at and, and recommit ourselves to or um, plan for and, and build the leadership within the organization? But the partnerships are key. Yeah. Yeah. What do you do to have fun? To have fun. Right now? I'm reading a lot of uh, law enforcement stuff. Um, <laughs> my weekends are full of nat that now. Um, but um, my wife and I like to go hiking. Um, we enjoy going to the theater. <laughs> she sings in the Seattle Women's Chorus, yeah. and so I spend a lot of time um, watching that and enjoying that. Um, we enjoy our family and friends a lot. Do you depend on them to help you get through the uh the stress of the job. I depend on her a lot. You depend and on her. She gets to listen to a lot of things and be woken up by the 3 a.m. phone calls, yeah. you know. But uh, um, I'm very, very blessed and very honored and um, have a great command team with me that have many years of experience in the sheriff's office and across um, the county. And so um, I don't have to do it all by myself, you know. Um, it's really important to push decision making down and. Um, there's each of us work really well together. Yeah, uh, one thing I didn't ask you earlier, and I meant to, was uh, regarding immigration status and, and uh, whether your officers will be looking into that, asking questions about that, or what's going to be the uh, policy. Sheriff Urk and Urquhart and I are very much aligned on this, and uh, it's uh, we have good policy in place. We have so much work to do. We we don't have time to do the federal government's job. And uh, it's really important to me and to the members of the organization that we maintain being accessible to everyone who resides and, and uh, travels through King County. And so um, knowing somebody's immigration status is not important to what we do every day. All right, well, how about uh, in a few months here, you come back, we sit down, we'll see how that blueprint's going. I would love to do that. All right. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. Sure. Appreciate it very much. All right. Good luck. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us for this edition of King County Connects. Uh, visit us online at kingcounty.gov slash KCTV. I'm Andrew Cerna, and we'll see you next time.